10 p.m. on the 20th day of April. Longitude 47 degrees east, latitude 10 degrees south. Depth 80 feet below the level of the sea. This is the coral jungle. Around the divers of Calypso, just beyond the circle of their lamps, night creatures move uneasily, stirred by the strange sight of man, the unaccustomed presence of light. Undersea explorers enter a well-ordered universe, seeking to learn its secrets, to observe and record its life, the strange, the beautiful, the tranquil, and the savage. Today, we begin a program of experimentation and exploration around a coral reef. Equipped with camera and radio, Philippe Cousteau rides the wind to survey an atoll. reports that there appears to be a dangerously narrow entrance through the fringing reef into a perfect lagoon. Calypso steams for the slot. Safely inside the lagoon, a coral reef and its exotic life surround Cousteau and the Calypso. Over a century ago, Charles Darwin peered into the waters of a reef, longing to observe the incredible variety of life below. But only recently, diving scientists have begun solving the riddles that confronted Darwin, bringing understanding of the coral world and the full dimension of its spectacle. Inside the lagoon, we are in a giant teacup. The outside of the cup is a wall reaching down almost two miles. 
The lip of the cup is a thin necklace of coral. Our first dive in a world so physically striking overwhelms our senses. We are no more explorers, but children in a store filled with surprises. We stop at random to look at the busy traffic in the crowded cities. Minute creatures, living coral, whose skeletons are cemented together by algae, form the reef. Each species of coral gathers into a distinct shape, like massive boulders. Tabletop coral fans out like flattened mushrooms. Elkhorn coral spreads like the branches of a Christmas tree. The brilliant pastels that entrance the eye come from encrusting layers of orange, brown, or red calcareous algae. As one generation of coral skeletons piles atop the next, the reef grows often as much as a half inch a year. The reef is solid, capable of withstanding enormous pressure. On any given day, the normal trade wind waves pounding on one of these atolls dissipate an average force of 500,000 horsepower. The giant construction shop with its myriad of little homes, caves and crevices is an attraction center for tropical marine life. A highly complex community develops in the reef a coral jungle with its own rules, its feasts, its tragedies. By chance, a fish is born with some special quality, like coloration, speed, size, shape that thwarts a predator. This fish survives and his kind flourishes. Around the reef, a delicate balance has been struck by all inhabitants. The ray, primitive cousin of the shark, perfected over 350 million years of evolution. Suddenly discovered in daytime, the night-walking sea slug's frantic race for shelter becomes an incredibly graceful dance. The moray eel, more frightening in look than temperament, often a coward, he lurks in reef caves seeking safety. Because of the manner in which they have evolved, all creatures find themselves special places, and there they thrive. From day to night, the cycle of reef life changes. The spiny urchin emerges in darkness to scuttle about the sandy bottom at an average speed of a quarter of a mile an hour, accompanied by starfish, shellfish, and a host of night-crawling creatures. Below the spines, the urchin is a tasty morsel of food, but only the thick skin to dare attack. Damselfish take shelter in the needle forest of the urchin's back. 
At the first sign of danger, a lurking predator, they run for cover. The damsels are no trouble to the urchin, nor does he bother with them. The little fish have found a sympathetic host. And even when the spiny creatures gather in large flocks, each damsel seems to know its own urchin. We wanted to see if we could lure the damsels away from their house. Trapping urchins in a plastic globe created chaos among the fish. In one brief survey, the damsels make it clear that they would never consider the diver as a substitute for their favorite urchin. It is home again, home again, quick as they can. It was on the 1st of March that we met Maldive Islanders at work on a coral reef. The Maldive Islands, off the southern tip of India, once lay on the great spice routes of Europe's merchant princes. The islanders have only one source of construction material, their own fringing reef. They harvest coal all year round to use as stones and to make cement. It may help build houses, but it reduces the natural protection offered by the fringing reef against the waves of the ocean. A number of such overexploited islands have recently disappeared, eaten away by the swell. But it is not only man whose way of life destroys coral. Herds of bumphead parrotfish, looking very much like cattle, graze off the reef itself. Living coral is the food these fish prefer. To obtain it, the bumphead uses its powerful horny beak. He bites off chunks of coral, crushes them, grinds them into fine sand, and digests the flesh of the polyps. The bump head excretes the remaining sand. A single fish is estimated to produce five tons of sand a year. For many species on the reef, schooling is the principal form of defense. Some experts believe that in order to strike, a predator must single out one fish from the group. He is confounded by the school, a swirling, confusing cloud of motion and mass Smaller species of predators like these barracuda also school for protection, but probably also for more effective attack. The larger the fish, the greater the likelihood of being a loner and not needing the support of a school. Coloration is part of protection. The bands and blotches adding further to the predator's distraction. A fish's colors identify him, give notice of his presence to other creatures on the reef. But threatened by the approach of a diver, this unicorn fish retreats and darkens his colors. Still sought out, he flees, less conspicuous than he was before. A school moves with uncanny precision, turning and flowing like a creature with a single brain. The secret of this precise coordination is the presence of lateral lines along the sides of each fish. These lines consist of nerves sensitive to subsonic pressure waves. A movement yards away from the school is instantly detected by each of the fish.
We have found that the smaller the fish, the greater their tendency to school, and the more sensitive they are to any change in the environment. The diver uses his hand to generate slight pressure waves and actually becomes the unquestioned master of a fish ballet. But schooling is only one form of protection from predators. The porcupine fish possesses another. His spikes are in themselves formidable. But at the first sign of danger, the porcupine inflates himself with water. Once fully inflated, the porcupine can no longer swim effectively, but neither can he be eaten. Beautiful sea anemones are often called poison ivy of the sea. They are living animals whose sticky tentacles are poisonous. They sting, inflicting severe pain and can even paralyze fish the size of a sardine. One tiny creature, the clownfish, enjoys complete immunity from the anemone and lives in close association with it. A fish coming in contact with the anemone is helplessly paralyzed and would soon be digested. Bernard liberates the fish, but since he was stung, his behavior is not quite normal. Predators become aware of his weakness and immediately take advantage of an easy prey. No mercy is the law of the jungle. An aggressive grouper noses in. But the clownfish are safe from this intrusion, for even the grouper will not risk the anemone. The clown and the anemone are truly partners, living in what scientists call symbiosis. The clown darts out to food sources the anemone cannot reach. It feeds itself until its hunger is sated. But then it does fulfill its part of the symbiosis by bringing food back to the anemone. The clownfish and the anemone have long been known as partners, but this is the first time a clownfish has ever been filmed actually feeding the anemone. June 13th. We are going to try a test with a friendly grouper. Philippe Cousteau will lead the dive, assuming the primary responsibility of photographing this experiment. He is accompanied by Raymond Cole. Many of the sedentary reef fish have conquered a vital space around their home and consider it to be their property. 
There have been successful attempts to prove this theory in laboratory aquariums. But to observe it in the uncontrolled environment of a reef, a simple device must be used. A mirror is something unprecedented in the undersea world. It can be used to set off an unusual reaction in a fish, particularly a gentle and lethargic grouper. This rock cave is the territory of our grouper. Confronted with this strange invader, the mirror image of himself, the grouper's instincts impel him to maintain the territory he has staked out. Baffled but persistent, the grouper tries to outflank his enemy. To increase the threat around the borders of the grouper, a series of four mirrors is installed, creating a menacing variation on the amusement park attraction. A fish like the grouper patrols the borders of his territory. Other fish are admitted into his realm only if the master so desires. It is conjecture whether he does this to protect his food supply or simply out of pride of ownership. Actual prolonged combat is rare. The contest for territory is usually more threat than fight. Assessing the situation, the grouper now takes the only course of action allowed by its instincts. Although perplexed and besieged from every corner, he attacks. July 12th, four months at sea, and it seems as if the work has just begun. The jam sessions on board Calypso take many forms and express many moods. Among the men, there are separate musical groups a classical string quartet, a rock and roll band, and a group that plays modern jazz. For me, another kind of music, the sounds from the ocean floor. There are many noises in the silent world. Shrimps, crustaceans, fish and mammals produce sounds. Except for the sonar signals and loud chatter of sea mammals, the noise level is generally low. Only with a sensitive hydrophone and powerful amplifiers is it possible to record, identify and analyze the noises of the sea. With specialized equipment, not only sounds, but sights too, can be recorded in their most minute detail. Here, 30 feet beneath the surface, an aquatic motion picture studio. 
roofed to screen out natural illumination, equipped with lights, camera, and plenty of action. It is called macro photography, the close-up study of a seemingly empty plot of land on the ocean floor that with time and patience yields a wealth of hidden animal life. Motion picture producers beneath the sea, they share one problem with filmmakers the world over. The stage is set, the camera is ready, but all must wait for the arrival of the actors. A rare crustacean appears in gargantuan detail. Its eyes set on separate swivels. They shut out excessive light through a unique internal system resembling Venetian blinds. Beneath its body, small paddles act as ventilators for eggs and shovels to dig into the sand. For many years, I have been mystified at the sight of tiny volcanoes on the ocean floor. Before this voyage, we have never been able to discover what causes them. To capture the mysterious Vulcan, the diver uses a new narcotic, hoping to subdue it into momentary sleep. Beneath a plastic bubble, the potion is released. Recording this creature on film was a moment of good fun. At long last, we have learned that Mephistopheles is a two-inch mantis shrimp. July 25th. A report that there is a nesting triggerfish below starts some unusual preparations on board. Bernard is fortified with tape and burlap, arming himself much like a gladiator going into battle. In this world of coral, weakness means death. The species that is flawed soon dies out. The weak and the uncautious will be eaten. Among the creatures of the sea, courage is a common commodity. To the trigger fish, barely 15 inches long, it comes most strongly during spawning season, when the mother is left to keep water flowing on her eggs and guard them from intruders. During this time, all who come close to her eggs, whether large or small, must be aware of her fury the instinct to preserve the species far outweighs the instinct to preserve oneself. And not even an animal outsizing her by a hundred times is too big to be reckoned with. dedication, 
only a small number of the thousands of offspring will survive. We have been on the reef for four weeks, examining life on the ocean floor. Now, to set up a new experiment in fish behavior, we must collect living samples. The sea does not give up its life without a struggle. To lessen the chances of damage to the specimens, Joseph Francois, the ship's doctor, prepares a drug. It is called MS-222, shot from a specially designed gun. Its injection into the reef induces a brief sleeping period among the inhabitants. Armed with this formidable looking weapon, the divers descend. They carry with them the Cousteau-designed bubble trap. Made of sealed plastic, it has a one-way entrance. Perfect for containment in water or on land. Unequaled for observing specimens of living aquatic life. Stunned into unconsciousness, he is placed in the bubble until he revives. And the harvest continues. A familiar friend, the clownfish, is the most puzzled. For the first time, his formidable companion, the sea anemone, cannot protect him from danger. Rare specimens all. In any square yard of ocean bottom thrives animal life valued in the hundreds of dollars to fish fanciers the world over. To the tiny damselfish, the game of hide and seek has a life or death connotation. Knowing every convolution of the coral he calls home, the moment a threatening gesture is made, he seeks safety in the depths of its prickly spines. To predator and curiosity seeker alike, this protection is infallible. Into the life of the reef, a new situation is introduced. An artificial aquarium within nature's own aquarium, where confinement has the look of freedom. Barriers are invisible, and the teeming population must come to grips with a problem they've never experienced before. Interestingly, the first to come to their aid are members of the same species, sensing trouble through the erratic swimming behavior of their imprisoned companions. Next to take notice are the predators. Merely curious at first, they become excited by the panicky behavior within the bubble, and their mood changes to attack. A large grouper seems to wonder how to best take advantage of their predicament. The grouper recognizes that the fish in the bubble are acting strangely. In the coral reef, this is equal to a death sentence. At the first sign of unusual behavior in a fish, he will be eliminated. The look of the fish in the bubble says they are in trouble. Therefore, they are fair game.
frustrated, the wrath of the predator is aroused. Breaking a bubble loose from its mooring, the grouper engages in an angry game of football. Were he a bit larger, or the ball a bit smaller, the game could end in a sudden gulp. When they are finally released unharmed, the fish will find safety once again in the protecting arms of the reef. The continuity of reef life will be restored. August the 1st, we prepare our last important exploration of the reef. Years ago, Darwin looked at the same kind of atoll from above and speculated about its origin. At first, a great volcano stood in this place. Along its sloping sides, coral began building a fringing reef, creating a circle around the island. As the volcano slowly sank into the ocean, the reef continued to grow. Inside the ring, a shallow lagoon was formed as sand and coral debris filled the area around the subsiding mountain top. Falco leads the team of deep divers on the journey toward the bottom of the reef. 150 feet is the normal working limit for divers breathing air. Further down, the diver's mind becomes confused by what is called nitrogen narcosis, making professional work a hazardous procedure, and amateur diving a foolhardy escapade. The submerged decompression chamber facilitates deep diving, but the major problem does not involve going down, but coming back. To make the ascent safer, more comfortable, and faster, the ponderous SDC is used. Lowered in water at the depth where the deep divers should stop their ascent for the first decompression stage. It serves as a way stop. Delois, the cameraman, Bonacy, and Falco will be using a helium oxygen mixture to avoid deadly narcosis while working at 200 or even 300 feet of depth. Beyond the rigid check system, there is an extra sense of care to the preparation of the dive. The helium oxygen mixture goes into an extra large tank block, twice as cumbersome as the streamlined Calypso backpacks. When the chamber reaches 150 feet, air divers will remain with it as tenders, while Falco, Bonacy, and Delois go to the bottom of the reef. Each foot they travel represents more than a human generation in time. At almost 300 feet, Falco discovers a cave. Eons ago, when the atoll was young, a strong glaciation period lowered the level of the oceans, and the action of waves have eaten away at the wall of the reef. The study of living animals in the reef holds endless surprises. But it is here, as we attempt to trace the fundamental physical history of the atoll, that my imagination is really challenged. 
Secrets compressed in coal across millions of years may be learned when we analyze the samples. Pulsations of the oceans through glaciation periods will be accurately dated. Helping sketch a living picture of Earth in its earliest days is the tantalizing prospect before us. Embedded in the coral are the signs of the life that existed around the reef. As the tiny polyps formed skeletons out of limestone they distilled from seawater, the reef grew. Generations of coral skeletons piled atop generations in nature's gradual cycle. This reef still lives, still grows, and it is possible to read in the coral of the cave the complex relationship between plant and animal that existed here long before men appeared. More and more, the living reef is threatened. It is at the mercy of a hurricane that would destroy the outer reef, of heavy rains that would reduce salinity, of water pollution from careless tankers passing by. Falco, Bonassi, and Delwa have worked for more than 20 minutes in the cave. They have been able to stay here only because of the helium. During prolonged deep dives, a large quantity of helium dissolves in the blood and body tissues. Now they must take a very slow ascent to avoid a severe or even mortal decompression accident. If they go up too quickly, the helium would begin bubbling in their bloodstreams, causing fatal bends. The first stop on their ascent will be the SDC, the Submerged Decompression Chamber. The chamber simulates a gradual ascent. There is one last difficult procedure to be accomplished. The narrow interior of the decompression chamber is too small to accommodate the men and their bulky tank packs. The yellow helmeted air divers stand by to help while the deep divers shed their tanks. With the tanks in place on the side of the chamber, the divers take one last long breath of helium and swim for the compressed safety of the chamber. I know we have taken all conceivable precautions. But a cable may snap, a valve may leak, with the life of three men committed to the mechanism. It is at times like these that I worry most about the men of my team. Once the three-ton chamber is on deck, the worst is over. Decompression will last one hour and 40 minutes. Just 20 years ago, this almost routine venture would have been looked upon as a miracle. For the last 30 minutes of their decompression time, Falco, Bonassi, and Delois breathe pure oxygen to finally rid their systems of both helium and nitrogen.
It is August the 8th, four months since Calypso arrived at the atoll. Always, we leave a coral reef with regret. The cathedral of stone lacework below is a precious container of beauty, and we have done our best not to disturb the delicate balance of life within it. Millions of years ago, a volcanic island stood proudly here, covered with forests, and aloud with bird song, it slowly sank deep into the ocean. Today, the bustling coral jungle is a fragile memorial to a long lost paradise. <laughs> <laughs> 